Chapter 1, Introduction to Linux. In this first lecture in week 2, we're going to take a minute and go through and talk about what Linux actually is. We need to put everything in the proper perspective if anything's going to make sense as we move forward. So what is Linux? Linux is what's known as an operating system. Okay, great. What's an operating system? That's what we're about to talk about. But before we can discuss what an operating system is, we've got to talk about what they run on. What is a compute node? Hmm, that's an interesting term, compute node. I didn't pick that by accident. Had we been having this class 20 years ago, I would have used the term computer. Because really, that's what we ran operating systems on. Either server type computers like these, this Dell and this HP you see right here in the picture, or a desktop computer. And back in the 90s, there would have been a big box sitting on your desktop with a big CRT monitor and all that. The traditional sense of the computer. But here in the 21st century, our definition of what is a computer has changed. Right? So we can no longer just refer to things as computers. We refer to them as compute nodes. All right, what is a compute node? You're looking at it right here in this, in this picture. A compute node is something that has a chassis or a box, right? See the square right here? And within that box has certain pieces of hardware. It has to have some type of processor. The CPU, for example, the brains of a compute node, is a key part of it. So it has to have some kind of processing unit. It also has to have some kind of short-term memory. And by short-term, I mean volatile memory, memory that goes away when the, the system is switched off. We know this traditionally as RAM, random access memory. It has to have a long-term storage, or it should. This is storage that persists past reboots. It means it stays around after you turn the power off, and it's still there when you power back up. The last piece you need is some t interface to some type of network. A NIC, Network Interface Card. Traditionally, these have been wired cards, and on traditional computers, like especially servers, they still are. But more and more, these NICs are now wireless cards. And not just Wi-Fi, things like Bluetooth and near-field communications and all, all that. Something that gives us access to a network. Well, lots of devices nowadays meet this definition of a compute node. I mean, look at our mobile devices. Our phones and tablets are really just compute nodes. An iPhone is really just a computer that you can happen to make phone calls on. Same with Samsung devices, tablets, whatnot. What about a smartwatch? Absolutely a compute node. Chassis, processor, RAM, some type of storage, although it's probably going to be flash storage, right? A solid state storage, and a network interface. Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever it happens to be. We can even move beyond the traditional compute devices. Go into a Home Depot or Lowe's, walk into the appliance department, and you're going to see smart refrigerators. Right here, look at that. That's a fridge with a computer screen on the front. Well, this, computer sc this fridge is linked to a home's Wi-Fi. And you can do things like surf the web on it, you can play music on it, it displays local weather, recipes, that kind of thing. Compute node? Absolutely by definition. We can go so far as to look at appliances, like kitchen appliances. Right here on the lower right corner is a smart crock pot. I'm not kidding. This is a real product. In fact, you can see a little Wi-Fi symbol right there. This is a crock pot that you'll control really anywhere on the planet from an application on your smartphone. Compute node? By definition, yes. So any compute node just by itself, just the hardware, doesn't do very much. I mean, I turn the power switch from off to on, and if there's just hardware there, really what's it going to do? It's going to power on, 
maybe do a power on self test, a post, and just kind of stop. Right? Hardware by itself doesn't get the job done. We need software. Or specifically in this case, system software, an operating system. The operating system, as you can see right here, installs directly on the hardware. And the operating system gives us a platform for which to run application software. This is really the reason why we have compute nodes to begin with. Why am I going to have a Dell server sitting out there if it's not providing some business function like maybe a Microsoft Exchange server or an Apache web server or something along those lines? Linux is an operating system, so that makes it system software. Well, we can decompose the operating system into really two major components. Now OS's have a lot of components to them, but really we can split them down to two major halves. We have what's called the kernel and the shell. The kernel, and that's kernel as in popcorn kernel with a K, not Colonel Sanders, its function is to deal directly with the hardware. The kernel is the brains of an operating system. This is where all the big money hardcore programming went into was to create the, 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 the logic and the intelligence if you will behind the OS. This hardware doesn't do anything without the kernel telling it to do that. Well us as human beings we're up here somewhere right we, we, we don't get to interact with the kernel. We wouldn't understand it if we did. The kernel is the realm of interrupts and hardware commands and stuff like that. It's, it doesn't make any sense to us. That's where the shell comes in. The shell of an operating system is there to provide a user interface for people. So we give commands to the shell. The shell then passes those commands on to the kernel. The kernel then acts on those commands directly with the hardware. And when we get a reply back from the hardware, it happens in reverse. The hardware talks to the kernel, which in turn gives a response back to the shell, which in turn is something that we can see. Every operating system has a kernel, and in most of them, we don't really get to see it. It's there. Windows has, an oper has a kernel, the Windows kernel. It's actually a big part of the OS, but it's monolithic. It's built into the operating system. It's cooked into it. We don't really get to see it. We certainly don't get to pick which kernel we want to use, and most OSs are like this. Linux, however, as, as we're going to see over the upcoming weeks, is very, very, very modular, which means I can pick and choose. If I don't like some particular component, I can pull it out and plug another one in. As long as it fits in the slot, it'll work, so to speak. Well, the Linux kernel is no different, right? I can, Linux ships with a kernel, whatever distribution I happen to get will come with a kernel. If I don't want to use that kernel, I can pick something else. This is a screenshot from, from uh, the Linux kernel archives, and this is the official su site for Linux kernel. See, it's kernel.org. And you can see the different versions of kernels right here. Now, in future weeks, we'll talk about what all these numbers mean. But for right now, just accept that version 4.15-RC8 is a different version from version 4.14.14 all the way down to 3.2.98, whatever, right? If I, and all these different kernels are different versions from different time periods. They have different functionalities. Some are specific for certain things. Some are more general purpose, whatever. If I need functionality of a specific kernel, I can go out and I can get it and I can completely plug it in. What about the shell? Most of our compute nodes do have a shell. Well, they all do, really. Some are more obvious than others. How about on your iPhone? The iPhone iOS shell is right here, right? It's this touch screen with little icons I'm going to tap on. It's really a GUI. It's a graphical user environment. And that's it. That's how I interact with my smartphone. Smartwatches, the same way. There's their shell. Different devices have different types of shells. 
IBM PCs, desktop computers, that type of thing. Likewise, they had a shell. Now, back in the day, the IBM PC was introduced back in 1981, running an operating system called DOS, the disk operating system, which had its own kernel and a shell. The DOS shell looked like this, right? Black screen, white letters, all text. This is called a command line environment, a CLI. And in the early days of personal computing, all operating systems shells were CLIs. They can be very powerful. I can do a lot. You can do a lot with a CLI. Problem is a steep learning curve, right? These shells are languages and they have their own syntax and words and sentence structures. And it can take a lot to learn how to be productive on one of these systems. In the 1990s, Windows really kind of changed that. Now I know Mac introduced the, the graphical user interface back in the 80s, but it really didn't become commonplace in business especially until Microsoft picked it up with, with Windows. This is the Windows shell that that's all familiar that's familiar to all of us. Right? A GUI, a graphical user environment. I would click on things to make them to, 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 to do certain things. This really reduces my learning curve. Instead of having to have a three inch thick book on my desk full of commands that can be very difficult to learn, especially for non technical type of people. This provides a much simpler environment to work in. The trade-off on the GUI, however, is usually less flexibility, right? Well, and just like the kernel, in most operating systems, I don't get to pick my shell. It's whatever ships with it. Windows especially, right? If you don't like the Windows 10 desktop environment, there's not really a whole lot you can do about it. Yes, there are add-on programs I can do to make it look different, but that's literally window dressing, pun intended. It's just programs changing the appearance of it. It's doesn't, not actually changing the shell itself. Linux, you know, like its kernel, it, Linux shells are modular. Now, Linux shells are CLI environments, and all of them are. This is an example of a Linux shell called Bash, which is a very, very common default shell nowadays. It has been for years. It's a CLI, right along the same lines as the old DOS CLI, with the same benefits and the same drawbacks. The Linux shell can be extremely powerful. In fact, as admins, we spend most of our time here in the CLI environment. But for non-technical people, they can be very challenging. Don't like the Bash shell? You have a choice. There's all kinds of different Linux shells. And these are all CLIs, right? I've got the C shell, which is based on the old C programming language. The turbocharged C shell, TCSH, which is an enhancement of the C shell. I've got the corn shell. I've got the Z shell. And on and on and on. All these shells have their own functionality. They have their own syntax, although the syntax is similar across many of them. There are differences. And different shells are better suited for different purposes. Which one are you going to use? It depends what you need your system for. Now, doesn't Linux have a GUI? Haven't we seen pictures of screenshots of, of, of Linux systems running with graphical user environments? Absolutely. There's all kinds of desktop environments for Linux systems. The key difference, though, is on a Linux system, this GUI isn't really the shell. This is a program running on top of the actual CLI Linux shell. And like the Windows GUI, it can, it can make things a lot more simple for less experienced people or for those with a less technical background, but it also has the same drawback that they tend not to be as powerful. That's why as admins, we're usually here instead of here. The desktop in front of you right now, the GNOME desktop, this is one of the standard default desktops on, on most Linux distros. It has been for decades now. It's very Window-esque, right? You would click on icons and these little pull-down menus almost looks like an old Mac system, whatever. Don't like this? You can pick another one. 
install and run KDE, the KDE desktop environment. This is a completely different program that runs on top of the Linux shell that gives you a completely different desktop environment. This one happens to be very Windows-esque. Start button down here and all its own sets of programs and all that. Don't like KDE? Go out and download and install the Enlightenment desktop. This one kind of has a Mac OS look to it with the uh, taskbar down here and the way it structures things. There are many, many more. Some are extremely lightweight. Some are very specialized. It all depends on your purposes. It all depends what, what you need it for. So in these last few minutes, we went through and we defined what an operating system actually is. Operating systems allow access to the hardware functionality of compute nodes. And I'm harping on this compute node thing because that's where we tend to find lots of Linux. Yes, Linux has a huge presence on enterprise servers. It drives a great many of the web servers and web functionality on the internet. But from the consumer perspective, we tend to see it on appliance type devices, like mobile devices, like like uh, smart watches. If you have an Android, that is running a version of the Linux operating system. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact your instructor, and I'll see you next lecture.